Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, it's already February, if you can believe it. It's a balmy 42 degrees right now in downtown Baltimore. It's the warmest we've seen since I don't know when. Um, getting our um, peeps of the peeb, as you know, um, tonight for February. Uh, we were going to skip the called shot lunch this month because that was supposed to be the week the Babe Ruth Museum was going to do the virtual bash. Um, it's actually going to be bumped by a week, but we're still not going to have a, a called shot lunch this month since uh, I have just too much going on. So it'll be this and an hour. <clears throat> end of the month baseball babble on uh, the final Sunday of the month, which I believe is the 27th. Um, other chapter news, uh, anybody who wants to contribute to the next chop, uh, if you know how to reach Ruth, send in your article and, and whatnot. Um, hopefully to get that out uh, by the end of February, early March, if there is a spring training. Um, right. And secondly, there um, is gonna be a shuffle in officers for the Baltimore Babe Ruth chapter in the near future. It's gonna be some elections and nominations. So if you're on our chapter roster, you should get an email in the next couple of days from Leslie Hoffmeister um, with a roster of candidates or if you wanna nominate anybody and how you vote. And uh, Bruce is actually gonna be stepping down but I'll let him formally tell you guys that in the, uh, in the near future. Um, we are the third largest chapter in Sabre um, after Manhattan I think is number one and Washington DC, Bob Davids is number two. Um, we're close to 500 people on our roster. And uh, it's pretty amazing for a group that's only been around since 2015. Um, I can tell you that the convention's moving forward. Scott Bush has been in touch with the Orioles and we've already put 600 and some odd tickets on hold for the Friday night game um, against Boston, which is a 7.05 game. The Saturday game is a four o'clock. Um, and so Sunday is the Little League Classic. The Royals in Boston will be playing up in Williamsport. Um, so uh, other than that, I can't think of any other administrative news. Um, welcome, everybody, obviously. Um, tonight we have Roger Snell. And I forget what home chapter you belong to, Roger. Are you Cincinnati or uh, Louisville? Louisville. OK. Um, yeah. He's going to talk to us about his book, uh, both he and I. He took his hat off, but we had our Cubs hats on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> solidarity and uh he's gonna tell you about his book and he has a, a video um and slideshow for us too so if you can be on mute if you have any questions put them in the chat um and we'll uh talk to you when his presentation is done thanks go ahead Raj. well thanks a lot uh peter i appreciate the invitation and uh, thank you all for joining uh nice turnout already here so that's pretty neat um uh, i'm gonna try to Get the screen up here and make sure everything's working. And uh, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, can you see everything? Kind of give me a thumbs up. If, uh, you're if good, you're Roger. Okay, you're good. good. All right. Well, uh, the book, uh, Root for the Cubs, about Charlie Root in the 1929 uh, Cubs. The reason I focused on 1929 is. Uh, they finally got back to the World Series. They thought they had waited a really, really long time uh, in 1929. They didn't realize how long the wait was really going to turn out to be. So it was their first time back. And uh, for me, uh, uh, I wanted to focus on one season where I could kind of follow the news and the day by day and, and uh, tell a good story in that way. Of course, there were a lot of significant events that happened in uh, 1929, but the key for me and the real reason was I had my own Moonlight Graham that lived just five doors away from my hometown in Western Ohio, a real rural area called Arcanum, Ohio, and Burley Horn, Trader Horn, uh, made it only one season in the majors, and that was the 1929 Cubs. And he only got one win. He was just up briefly and got his one win. And uh, I was in high school walking home. He was listening to the Reds on the radio, sitting on his front porch swing when uh, Burley told me that he had pitched in the majors and pitched for the Chicago Cubs. And of course, I ran home, 
got the baseball encyclopedia out. When I saw his uh, name in there and saw the one win, I ran back and uh, to talk to him uh, quite a bit more. So the, the very first story I ever had published was even before I was officially a newspaper reporter, uh, was a story that I wrote about uh, Burley Horn. And so that was how 1929 became the focus and uh, the, uh, the, the spark uh, that got me going. And this was my Moonlight Graham before even Field of Dreams, years before Field of Dreams. And I thought it was pretty cool that uh, you know, only got that one win, but one of the key things in this story to note, and obviously you can't read the, the text, but what I thought was great is, uh, he told the story about pitching to Babe Ruth in an exhibition game, uh, when he was in the minor, when, uh, Burley was in the minor leagues, uh, Ruth came, uh, on the East coast for, a kind of a barnstorming exhibition game. And Burley was so proud, uh, because he got, uh, Ruth to pop up. Uh, the first time he faced him, he popped up in the infield and Burley said, I really don't like to talk about the second at bat. He said the second time Ruth hit the ball so hard on a line drive, it about took his head off and it was uh, hit so hard, it knocked the paint off the center field wall. So he said he likes to just talk about that first uh, at bat where, where he got Babe Ruth out. But anyway, uh, there's the there's that one win uh, that he got for the 29 Cubs. But what was interesting about uh, Burley was uh, he won 189 games in the minor leagues. Of course, he lost almost as many as well. But uh, look at the look at the career 21 seasons uh, that he uh, played in professional baseball. So. That was the spark, and that was just the minor cog that got things uh, going. I accumulated some details, uh, you know, his comments about Rogers Hornsby and about uh, what it was like to go to spring training at Catalina Island and all those things. And so that was about 1977, where I began to gather notes and string and all of that. But it wouldn't be until 30 years later that I would actually uh, finish the book. So I... I'd like to say that I'm a really methodical researcher instead of a very slow writer of why it took 30 years. But uh, I covered the uh, Ohio Supreme Court when I was a reporter for the uh, Akron Beacon Journal and uh, candidate for Supreme Court justice was Robert Gorman. And Robert Gorman was Charlie Root's nephew. And I didn't discover that until about halfway through the campaign when I learned that. And I told him about Burley Horn and about my interest in uh, the 1929 Cubs and all of that. And of course, when he told me that Charlie was his uh, uncle interested in that, and he said, well, would you like to talk to his daughter? And uh, I said, well, sure. And so that's Della. That is Charlie Root's daughter, Della. And she's holding a photos of her mom and dad, uh, her mom, Dorothy. And uh, little did I know, uh, Della had kept a journal and a scrapbook of all the years uh, from her childhood uh, to adulthood of her dad's uh, career. And I had the opportunity to meet her in Loma Linda, California. I flew out to see her interview her. And there's a couple of videos that I want to show you here of the interviews with her to show you how sharp she was. Uh, she was uh, pushing 90 years old. Uh, she, she passed away 10 years ago, but at the time she was in her 90s and you'll see from the video just how sharp she was. So the great thing about it was uh, spending Saturdays at the University of Kentucky Library. And then every Sunday calling Della with what I had found and what I had gone through day by day, working my way through the 1929 Chicago newspapers. And uh, so everything that I talk about here at first, and I'll go through it pretty quickly here about 1929, but I saved the best for last of 1932 and, and Babe Ruth and the Charlie Root uh, encounter, because I know that'll be of greatest interest, uh, obviously, to you all. But in the process of going through all the microfilm and day by day, uh, obviously the, one of the 
biggest news events of all in 1929 in Chicago in a warehouse not too many blocks away from Wrigley Field was where the Valentine's Day massacre uh, occurred. And uh, Al Capone was always believed to be the, the link to that. Uh, Capone was a huge Cubs fan. He had uh, really good seats. And of course there was an incident where Gabby Hartnett went over to talk with him. His photo was taken with him and that was a big uh, controversy. It got Gabby in a little bit of trouble. But uh, the warehouse shooting happened at 10 in the morning and at about noon is when Burley Horn and uh, uh, a number of the other Cubs got on the train at Union Station to head to Catalina for spring training. So all of that happened within a couple of hours uh, on that date and it really gave some great life to the story to be able to tell something historic like this that was happening in the background uh, at exactly the time that uh, Burley was excited. To, it was the first time he'd even been west of uh, Ohio. He'd never even been to Indiana, let alone getting on a train at Union Station and headed to Catalina. So I tried to capture some of the flavor of, of that. This is a uh, the Root family at spring training, the, the great photo in the paper. And at that point, I think Della was like eight or 10 years old or something like that. Charlie Jr. Uh, was four or five uh, in that photo. And then here's a, another shot. Actually, it says here Della was 10, 10 years old in that photo. But they always uh, were at Catalina as a family uh, for spring training. And uh, one of the stories that that I loved was uh, finding out that uh, Root was a right-hander and everybody knew that, but by uh, nature, he actually was a lefty. He did everything else left-handed. He wrote left-handed, hammered nails left-handed. Uh, the only thing that he did right-handed was pitch. And uh, so one of the funny stories that I picked up from Della was that he used to hustle the rookies in pool at Catalina. He'd start out playing right-handed, which is what everybody thought he was. And then he'd get them to put a little money on the, the table and say that he thought he could even beat them left-handed. And of course they took that bet. They thought for sure they could get him. Well, that was his best, his best hand uh, for playing pool. So the other thing that I thought was fascinating is in spring training, he would horse around. He could pitch with either arm and pretty effectively, he actually could throw uh, uh, pretty well left-handed. And uh, Della asked him, well, why don't you do that? You could pitch more often, even more innings or whatever. And he said the problem wasn't his arms, it was his legs, that all of the, the strength and, and the uh, wear and tear was on the legs to uh, push off and all of that. The other thing that happened during the offseason leading into 1929 was Wrigley was able to acquire Rogers Hornsby, and that really is what put the Cubs over the top. That was that was the secret weapon uh, that really uh, put them into the World Series. And imagine uh, the Cubs version of Murderers Row. They had Hornsby and Hack Wilson, who both tied for the home run title in 1929 with 39 homers each. There was a secret leading into Catalina that I could not find a single story on. Either the reporters were not aware of it or it was one of those home, Homer kind of things where you don't disclose it or tell it or whatever because it's bad news. But Charlie, by the end of the 1928 season, was having all kinds of arm problems and, and it was really hurting it badly. And he uh, went to St. Louis to, to find a doctor so there wouldn't be any publicity about it or whatever. And what he learned uh, was a pretty huge secret coming into Catalina where he, he actually thought his career was over. Uh, there was, uh, the doctor said there was nothing they could do about his arm uh, that he really wasn't gonna be able to pitch again. And this was a, really emotional part of an interview uh, that I got with Della that, that made an interesting chapter for the book about this secret that, that Charlie was, was hiding and, and what really 
certainly looked like the end of his career. And so uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear this part of the interview. I do very well remember when dad came home after he'd been to Dr. Spencer. And uh, he came uh, up into the little apartment that we had, and he was uh, talking to mother. And he said, well, you know what he said. He said, I'll never pitch again. And with that, he began to cry. And I'd never seen my dad cry. I was 10. And, uh, you know, I knew he was the best ball player in the whole world. And, of course, it was, uh, well, my mother went over and she sat on the arm of the chair. And she said, now, Charles, she never called him Charlie. Charles, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard in my life. Of course, you're going to play again. You're going to be better than you ever were. And uh, uh, dad, of course, got under control. And I had taken my brother, who at that time would have been five, or four and a half, mm -hmm. and I had put him in the corner of the uh, sofa. I was getting him out of the way so he didn't have to see Dad grow. And uh, anyway, it was a very, very emotional thing, and it still is for me. It's hard for me to, yeah. to, to say it, but it, it happened. You know, that's a, a writer's dream. When you find something that's never been reported, and then you have the emotions of it, and then you realize what a different situation it would have been if that truly was the end of Charlie Root's career. I mean, everybody sees him as a rubber arm pitcher who pitched for years and uh, think that it came that close to, to stopping. And uh, Dorothy, his wife was just his biggest fan and she uh, supported him every step of the way. Uh, even when Charlie's own dad mocked him about trying to pursue a baseball career and, you know, having kids and that, he thought it was foolish. He thought it was uh, sure to end in disaster for him financially and, and all of that just never uh, supported him at all. And Dorothy never wavered in her support. And she basically told him to go to Catalina and fake it till you make it, uh, go and try. And the reason I'm showing you Andy Lotshaw's picture is he was a big old tough muscular Swedish trainer who actually uh, trained uh, for the Chicago Bears uh, and uh, for the Cubs. And Andy Lotshaw uh, was doing a rub down of Charlie's arm and working and working and working the arm and, and spring training was dreadful. I mean, Root was really struggling and having trouble. And there was, there was one story by Ed Burns in the Chicago Tribune that kind of hinted at a problem noting, uh, you know, the Cubs were still waiting for the old zip to come back to Charlie's uh, fastball. And that was the closest thing I saw to any indication that something was wrong, but in the training room, at Catalina, Andy Lotshaw was rubbing and rubbing his arm, and he said, well, this is really odd. And he found that the, uh, the main tendon in Charlie's right arm had rolled over to the other side. It was on the other side of his arm. And so Lotshaw, the, this big old strong muscular guy, just kept rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and moved that tendon back into position, and the rest is history. Charlie never had another arm problem again. He was back to normal. Uh, everything uh, uh, worked out fine just from that uh, incident. And so I thought it was pretty, pretty uh, fascinating that Dorothy got him to go despite uh, what all the evidence showed, what the doctor had told him, and and uh, the fortune of Andy Lodshaw figuring it out. And and you know, Root goes on for years after that. This is the view from William Wrigley's home on the porch. When you come into the harbor at Avalon, you'll see this house uh, up on the hill, more like a mansion. It's a bed and breakfast now. You can actually uh, stay here uh, at Mount Ada. And so this is the view from Wrigley's uh, porch. And 
that was a fascinating story to me. Here's William Wrigley, whose dad uh, made soap. And William Wrigley had to peddle it as a kid. And he always went by the stadium in Philadelphia and regretted he never got to go to a game because uh, his dad made him work all the time. And he vowed that if he ever had the chance, he would he would love to somehow be involved with baseball. Well, he wasn't good enough as a player, but he made his fortune, obviously, from chewing gum. And that opened up the opportunity for him to buy the Cubs and Catalina Island. He bought this whole island, turned it into the uh, training uh, uh, spring training site uh, for the Cubs. And this is the view out the other window of his home down on the field, which uh, just a beautiful place and, and amazing. The field is no longer there. It's all been forgotten by time. But the row of trees along the left field line and the country club in, in left field, uh, all those things are still there. So you can still kind of make out where the field used to be. It's still uh, an empty area. They play soccer there now. Uh, I had great hosts at the, the island, uh, all these old timers who love the Cubs and they kind of regret that there's no real celebration of the history of the Cubs. There's not even a marker at the field. There's no uh, real uh, celebration of, of what a big deal it was. And of course, Joe Saldana, you see here, restaurant owner, uh, he was shagging fly balls in the outfield during the last season at Catalina in 1951. And that's when Joe was uh, 11. And he was my tour guide. He drove me around in a golf cart and took me uh, to meet the, the mayor and all the key people in town, the tourism director. And uh, that's where I got a lot of the good historic photos uh, from uh, Catalina. Uh, they, they have a history museum there and they had some archives with some old rig, uh, uh, Catalina Island photos from the field and spring training and all of that. So I got some wonderful photos for the book that they allowed me to reprint and use uh, at no charge. This is Joe's uh, brother who owns the barbershop. And of course, anybody that knows the barbershop's where all the news is. That's, that's where uh, uh, everything on the island, the gossip, the news, the history and everything. And on that wall, all those newspaper clippings and photos and all of that it's kind of like the unofficial Cub Museum on Catalina Island is in that barber shop. So uh, it was just a wonderful day uh, at the island. Uh, here's some of those old photos and postcards that the museum had and allowed me to use. Here's what the field looks like uh, or looked like when, when I was there. Uh, so there's still hints of uh, the old field, but like I say, it's used for soccer now, no indication it was ever the Cubs. That's the team photo, 1929. Uh, one of the phrases has been repeated a lot. I kind of coined a little phrase about Hack Wilson, uh, where I said he was built like a whiskey barrel and usually contained the same ingredients. That kind of caught on, because <laughs> that was uh, the most accurate way to describe how rowdy a guy uh, Hack Wilson uh, was and what a party animal he was, but boy, what a player and uh, what a season he had in both 29 and 32. Uh, it's Dorothy and Charlie dancing uh, at the uh, uh, casino. It really wasn't a gambling establishment. It was called the casino uh, as, as a dance hall in a movie, a movie theater or whatever uh, that you saw in the harbor. And that one photo in the in the background. This is uh, the delivery that Rude had. I didn't realize that he was such a side armor, uh, but this is his delivery. This is game one of the 1929 World Series. Another picture of him warming up, that same sidearm uh, delivery. And then another photo from the game. You can kind of see him there on the mound. Uh, Wrigley. Uh, was at the game, a highlight uh, for him uh, to finally get his team to the World Series. And he certainly spent the money and made the moves, like I say, to acquire Hornsby. And the Cubs had the second highest payroll in baseball 
And Charlie Root was the second highest uh, paid player in baseball in 1929. Only Babe Ruth made more money uh, than Charlie Root. Wrigley was very generous uh, with his players. Uh, he, he loved them, uh, uh, treated them well. And I'll tell you a, a little story near the end of uh, how Wrigley took care of uh, Charlie when the stock market crashed uh, at the end of 1929. Here's the uh, World Series scores in 1929. Uh, the uh, real debacle was game four, and Charlie Root was on the mound. Uh, and it stood until recently, uh, not too many years ago, uh, when the Athletics scored 10 runs in one inning in a World Series game. I mean, they were down eight to nothing, and the Cubs were rolling along. And you know, it would have been uh, uh, a critical win uh, for the Cubs, and it looked like a cinch. And the uh, Philadelphia A's came up with 10 runs in one inning, and, and Hack Wilson made two errors in that game that, that cost them dearly, lost the uh, uh, ball in the sun. And uh, there was – a lot of criticism about whether he was drunk uh, during the game in the class act after the game, immediately after the game, they were trying to make him to go to the world series and Charlie Root wasn't having any of it. He uh, was a huge uh, defender of Hack Wilson saying they wouldn't even have been in the world series without how hard and how well Hack Wilson had played. So number one advocate, uh, for Hack uh, was Charlie Root. There's what Ed Burns had to say about it in the Chicago Tribune. Uh, we've looked at her scorebook glassy-eyed for an hour now. There must be some mistake, but 10 she is, folks, about how horrible that loss was. There's a autograph photo to his pal, Charlie Root, uh, signed by Hack Wilson. And there's Root with uh, Charlie Root Jr., Hack Wilson. And I've got a chapter on, uh, on the train ride back to Chicago. And this was in a, a great book uh, by, uh, no, I should have I wrote down the reference. Great book, uh, biography of Hack Wilson by a Sabre member uh, who told about how hard Hack Wilson took it. But the part that he didn't know about is the part that Della told, uh, that Charlie told. About two or three in the morning, the players uh, woke up. They, they heard this banging and banging in the middle of the floor of their railroad car. And Hack Wilson was just so distraught. He, he was uh, sprawled out on the floor and just pounding the floor, so upset that he had cost him that game and uh, took it really hard. And when they finally arrived in Chicago and pull in uh, to Union Station, he was the one that got all the cheers and the fans really rallied around him to kind of buck him up. And I, I thought that was a pretty neat story with that. So now as we get to the uh, end of the 29th season, October, obviously that was the historic stock market crash that led to the Great Depression. And Here's the uh, World Series share and the money that the players got. Uh, Root was making 22000 but uh, his World Series share was quite a bit uh, more there to, to, to boost him. And at that time, um, Ruth was making $70,000 a year. So there was a huge gap of from first to second on payroll or on pay. Uh, so anyway... That was a lot of money uh, for that time. And Wrigley wanted to make sure that his uh, players were taken care of. And he talked to uh, Root earlier in 1929 of investing in the stock market, put, put a bunch of this money on the stock market. That'd be the greatest way to, to grow his money and assure that he had money down the road. <clears throat> the uh, the stock market crashed, Wrigley called Root into his office and asked Root how much money did he put into the 
into the market and, and Ruth said $3,000. I mean, that was more than 10% of his gross uh, pay for the year. And uh, Wrigley immediately wrote him a check for $3,000 and, and handed him a check to make up for that bad advice that he had given him. And, you know, he no reason he had to do that and no reason uh, to expect that. But it just shows the character of Wrigley and what he thought of his players. Uh, I, I just thought that was a neat touch. So here's what the Roots think about Babe Ruth. Sorry to you all there at the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore and all of that, but this, and this is what the uh, Root family thinks of Babe Ruth. They still have this license plate, Babe Who. And uh, Della's uh, great quote is, that big fat guy had pointed, you'd think we would have seen it. Uh, she was at the game in 1932, so we've jumped from 29 to 32, obviously. And uh, I want to play probably the most emotional part of the uh, the interview with Della when I asked her, uh, did Babe Ruth point? And then uh, in the second part of this uh, interview, she'll tell you about the day before Charlie died when she was holding his hand uh, in the hospital. And I, I just, this is really what puts the, the heart and soul into the book is when you've got these personal accounts like this. So let me, let me play that for you. Uh, so did Babe Ruth call a shot? I know I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. He didn't, and they, I think he admitted many times that he didn't. I remember, uh, you see, the, there was nothing in the paper about a call shot until four days after that particular game. And uh, he was asked many times, did you point it? He would say, well, it's in the paper. And, but the following spring at spring training, where he was training, why Hal Cotton, who was the radio announcer, and also he wrote for the paper, uh, he went down to wherever they trained, I don't know, but he went down there and made a point of talking with Babe Ruth, and Babe Ruth said, well, of course I didn't point, I would have been a fool to point on a picture like Ruth. Uh, and the, the legend as it grew and grew on the cold shot, how much did that bother your dad? At first, not at all, because uh, right after that series of 1932, we went to Australia and all through the South Pacific. Mother wanted to see all of the South Pacific Islands. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And every place we went, why there would be press, you know, to meet him and have a picture and so forth. I'll never forget when we landed in, in Australia, in the paper that night said, American baseballer showed up in Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so it didn't, at that time, didn't bother him at all. But as he grew older, and that was all they ever asked him, they never, he, you know, it was a fine pitcher. There won't be any other pitcher ever to win 201 games for the same team. And although he was a very humble man, I never ever heard him talk about baseball or I did this or I did that. He just didn't ever talk about it. It did bother him, and the day before he died, I told you this, I know, but I was holding his hand, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, Della, I gave my life to baseball, and I'll be remembered for something that never happened. Yeah. One of the the great experiences uh, as when the book came out, uh, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, well, first of all, the Chicago Public Libraries made sure they had uh, copies of the book and that really touched Della because she thought years after she's gone, there's gonna be a teenage boy that walks into the library and finds out about her dad's 200 wins and about all those other pitches that her dad threw and not just that one pitch. And that for me was really another reason why 1929 was the way to focus 
1932 and the called shot becomes an appendix. Uh, you can't write about Beirut and ignore it, but I certainly didn't want to dwell on it either. I mean, there's so much more uh, to the story. But before we get to the details on that, one of the things that Dallas said was she doubted that another pitcher would win 201 games for the same team. And for all us statistical Mets in Sabre, she really has a very interesting story idea and a very interesting point. When she made the comment uh, during the interview, it had uh, just occurred for Sabathia and Pettit. They, uh, and she was aware of that. And, and uh, her feeling was that's an end of an era. You're not going to see 201 wins by a pitcher on the same team. So I did some real quick digging uh, this week. Uh, really fast there might be some errors because I you know I obviously wasn't getting ready to publish a saber piece but uh, what I looked at was Clayton Kershaw you know do you think he's going to make it to 201 uh, I don't know uh, with the Dodgers uh, you know we'll even still be with the Dodgers yeah. Uh, yeah. as he reaches yeah as he reaches the end of his career and the amount of money that uh, he'll want and the extended contract and all of that. And the other thing to think about is uh, in this era of the bullpen, uh, you're not going to have 20 game winners very, you know, we're not seeing it very often. Uh, and uh, with free agency and, and, and all of that, I think uh, she actually has pretty good story idea. All right. Is Sabathia and Pettit the last of the 200 game winners on the same team? So anyway, I went through every single one of the career leaders on wins, took everybody uh, of 200 or more wins and went through. And obviously, Jim Palmer is your star, uh, you know, predating this back in the good old days. When you look at how many wins he had uh, for uh, Baltimore, but in recent history for the, the Cubs, Zambrano would have been obviously their best and, and uh, strung together quite a few years with the Cubs. He didn't even come close, 125. He's actually near the bottom of that list. But then over in the lower right, you'll see uh, uh, some of those who, who did it, uh, obviously before uh, her interview and, and back in the uh, in, in that time with Negro and Gibson and Glavin and Carlton and Marichal Smoltz and, and Clemens. Uh, but I just want to point that out because I think she has a really good point. There, there may be a possibility that a 200 game winner for the same team might be a, a rarity or a thing of the past. Now, the next slide I wanted to show you is the funny thing about how seriously Charlie took this called shot thing. During a family outing, Charlie Jr.'s wife pointed her wiffle ball bat to center field dramatically, and he went and hissed that ball right in and hit her in the neck. That's uh, what Charlie Ruth thought about uh, the called shot. And by the way, uh, back to what she said uh, about what was in the newspaper and what Babe Ruth claimed, uh, she actually is accurate uh, about the initial interviews, um, one of the first interviews that Ruth gave after the game, uh, he said that if uh, he had pointed, that would have been Bush League that to show up Charlie Root. That, in fact, what he said is, you show up Charlie Root, and you're going to get knocked on your ass. That was the direct quote of Babe Ruth. And Root definitely had that reputation. Uh, there was a game where um, Joe McCarthy wanted the pitcher to hit uh, the, the batter to get even for a play that had happened earlier in the game. And the pitcher tried two or three times and missed him. And they actually called Root in uh, cold. Uh, in relief, and obviously Root never relieved a game except this one time for the sole purpose to come in and hit the hit the batter with the pitch, and uh, Root hit him in the knee with one pitch. <laughs> so uh, you didn't mess with Root. 
if you showed him up, you were going down. And so uh, that was the initial reaction that Babe Ruth had. And then I think the honest way, uh, kind of the clever and honest way that Babe Ruth dealt with it after that is he would always say it was in the papers, uh, would ask if he called a shot. He, that's the way he would word it and say it. But everything about this, there's a reason why the debate about the called shot has continued on and on and on because it depended on where you sat, where you were, where your heart was, on what exactly happened. But Kurt Kandel is, is right here in Louisville, and it was his uh, great grandfather who had the infamous 16 millimeter uh, film. And uh, that film contains every at bat of Ruth and Gary uh, in that particular game in 1932. His great grandfather had bought this camera, which was really, really expensive uh, at that time and he had the camera and he had it all loaded up and he was excited and of course he knew he had limited film on what he could shoot so he went with the intent of just shooting the at-bats of Ruth and Gehrig and that is what is on that film and uh, and it's the entire at-bat and here's the critical photo which I'm sure you all have seen uh, this is the the essential frame. Um, and I think it's consistent with what Gabby Hartnett said, and he was the closest uh, uh, to it, uh, where Ruth is being heckled by the Cub dugout and being yelled at, and they've been mocking him uh, through the whole game. And what Hartnett said, Ruth said, is he's yelling over to the third base dugout and say and he had two strikes on him at the time uh when this uh frame comes up and he yells over to the dugout it only takes one to hit it is what uh gabby said uh, that he yelled and so obviously i don't want to conclude in front of della that he called his shot but i would have to say that's calling your shot uh, when you say it only takes one to hit it, and then the next thing you do is, is hit it out. Uh, but uh, what I think is so offensive and what hurt so deeply was the dramatic, horrible William Bendix movie of him standing there and dramatically pointing the center field, almost holding the game up to point and say exactly where he's going to hit it and all of this stuff. And there was a huge painting that was done of that exact image of, of him standing there defiantly pointing to center field. And that hung in the, the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown for a number of years. And this was another development after the book came out and got a lot of publicity. It's been footnoted a lot in Sabre. Whenever the called shot comes up, uh, a lot of this ends up, uh, especially Dallas quotes and, and some of these other things show up in the footnotes. And what I love is they removed that painting and no longer hangs in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's not accurate and it's not part of history. Uh, so, and that happened during Della's lifetime. These were things that were just really meaningful to her at the end of life that people would get to hear the other side and get to know uh, her dad uh, now, to me, the truth and the details are so much more interesting. The, uh, the pitch that Ruth hit out, Charlie was trying to waste the pitch. He, he threw a breaking ball uh, headed for the dirt, and Ruth hit it like a nine iron or a wedge. He hit it like a golf shot. And at that time, the scoreboard was down lower uh, at field level. And the home run was farther than anybody had ever hit a ball at Wrigley Field. I mean, it went clear over all of that and, and, and out. No question it was the longest home run ever hit uh, that Charlie or any of the Cubs had seen at, at Wrigley. And he did it on a waste pitch that was exactly where Root wanted to throw it. I mean, it was headed to the dirt. And, uh, and Ruth got it. By the way, the last uh, last home run, uh, last postseason home run of Babe Ruth's career uh, was during this game. 
So, uh, but then what is really hard is I would say uh, probably the most honest and, and the player with the most integrity is Lou Gehrig. And Lou Gehrig was on the on-deck circle, and he absolutely swears that that's exactly what Ruth did, that he pointed and called his shot, and no ifs, ands, or buts uh, about it. And I just think it's so interesting that you could have such strong, different opinions about the same event. And I think a lot of it just has to be the angle of where you were, where you sat, where you stood, where your heart was, whatever it might be. But uh, it's kind of uh, neat that that uh, controversy of discussion has stayed alive after all these years. But for me, uh, the joy was to be able to tell the rest of the story. And the rest of the story was, was about uh, Charlie Root. And, and I hope you were able to hear well and, and that passionate stuff from Della. I mean, I think it's wonderful stuff. So. Anyway, uh, I hope that all came across uh, well, and, and obviously uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, I have one. Uh, the, uh, of course, I, first of all, since my question doesn't touch so much on the uh, Della's uh, comments, I'll say those were great. And the whole presentation was, Mr. Snell, but, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, it, and it fascinated me when you were talking about that tendon that Andy Lotshaw uh, moved in uh, Root's arm. Uh, have you ever heard of that being done otherwise medically? I mean, we hear so much about Tommy John surgery, but uh, that sounded like a different type of procedure. And I was just wondering if you know of any other situation where a trainer or doctor was able to move a tendon from one side of the uh, elbow to the other. Well, I did, I did talk to a sports uh, surgeon who said that if that tendon did get out of alignment or whatever, you couldn't stretch your, uh, your elbow all the way. You, you wouldn't have the flex or the ability uh, to work the elbow like that. And he actually thought it was legit. He actually thought that was a possibility that 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 really could be the way that it happened. That it because he said when you think of the stress and how many pitches that Root had thrown, that might lead to that rare situation where that tendon would roll over, where it would get out of whack. I mean, it would never happen for us. I mean, there's nothing that we're doing with our arms or whatever that could cause something to go haywire so dramatically. So the sports surgeon I talked to said that that's, that's a very real possibility that that could have happened. But he said, what's amazing is that Lodgeshaw would have known that, that he would have, I guess he did so many arms and that he thought, well, this is weird. This is not in the right spot. Uh, so it's kind of like Lodgeshaw really knew his anatomy and uh, was able to figure out how to get it back in place. But it was magic. I mean, from that point on, the old rubber root never had another arm problem, never had pain uh, again, and, and, you know, went on for years after that. Yes, I just wonder, you know, it wouldn't happen to, to one of us, but I wondered in baseball's history whether some other pitcher might have experienced the same thing. And, of course, they might address, doc, the medical people might address it differently now. They might have some technique. But I, I just wondered if, uh, you know, you had ever heard of another pitcher who had a similar situation and how they dealt with it. No, but that's a good thought. And, you know, I wonder, is it possible other pitchers had their careers in because they didn't know uh, that they could solve that? I mean, that that's a good thought. I uh, didn't really think about that. But, no, I haven't heard of any other circumstances like that. But, uh yeah, who knows? Maybe there were other careers that ended uh, that could have been solved. And, and you know, uh, um, Charlie went to, he actually went to the St. Louis Cardinals uh, doctor. Uh, and, and the fact that they, you know, patient confidentiality existed even then and never leaked out. It never came out. But he went there. He didn't want to go to Chicago because he figured that would leak or people wouldn't know. 
so that was a, a good sports doctor in St. Louis, and he he didn't think there was anything they could do. He he really thought his career was done. And and when he came home, and that's what I thought was another emotional thing to have Dallas say it's the only time she ever saw her dad cry was to know or to think that his career was over. And then that fight in Dorothy, well, this that's nonsense. You're going to Catalina. You're gonna you're gonna get on that mound and you're gonna pitch. And it's just kind of neat how that all came together. Uh, and, and the magic uh, happened. Yes. Well, uh, I appreciate that. And, and your presentation was really good and uh, informative. Appreciate well, and you, can tell, you can tell how much fun I had. Uh, you know, I was a reporter for years. And then in later life, I, I founded a program here uh, for the state of Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky Proud was a marketing program to help farm families get their food into Kroger and Walmart and all of that. But the first half of my career was as a reporter. And you can imagine uh, just how your eyes light up when you hear stories uh, like this and you have those notes and details and all those things from Della. And, you know, like I say, the Saturdays looking at all that microfilm until you almost go blind. And then Sunday, talk to her and get all these funny stories and tidbits and the things about him hustling the rookies in pool and, and all of that. I always said that the worst part of reporting, it was, it was always great to research and interview people. But boy, the job would have been so much better if you didn't have to sit down and write it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just do the interviews and the research, and not have to sit down and do the grunt work. You're of not writing. the first writer yeah. I've heard say that. <laughs> <laughs> I have any more questions for Roger? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, Roger, was Andy Lacha highly regarded by the Cubs? Was he around for a long time? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, he uh, he was there, and then also with the Bears. It was kind of neat that he had yeah. basically those two pro uh, careers as a trainer. Oh, yeah, during, uh, yeah, during yeah during the winter he'd be with the Bears, and during the summer uh, with the Cubs. Yeah, yeah, and he was the character too. And in, in fact, uh, that was actually one of the things that Babe Ruth said about the. Uh, called shot about him riding him from the bench he said it's bad enough when the players are riding you but when the trainer is on your case <laughs> yeah and it was andy lotshaw was there yelling at him from the dugout too and, and harassing him so ruth yeah. actually specifically mentioned bad enough when the team's on your case but when you look over and the trainer is uh uh on your case uh that's pretty bad so that's where yeah. lotshaw came up again yeah oh yeah uh -huh. Yeah, um, um, the, the the Cubs were known for, uh, I guess, uh, for for loyalty um, uh, to their to their employees because Yosh Kawano, the uh, clubhouse attendant, oh, yeah. um, he was uh, he, he worked for the Cubs from goodness, I think from the perhaps the late thirties, even though uh, to uh, through to the seventies though as their, as their clubhouse attendant, uh, both uh, in spring training and. Um, the regular season and um growing up in chicago I, i'm familiar with the name of latcha as well too because um of course george hallis and, and wrigley were very close uh, yeah. uh the yeah. cubs uh, uh were their were their were their, uh, were their landlords uh, for, for many many years until 1970 until the bears played at soldier field uh, where, where they still are today though and um if i recall i think latcha was a trainer even well into the you know early sixties, quite possibly though. Are you aware of that? I'm not sure, uh, but I know it was years. I know it was years, and he was beloved uh, in the clubhouse and by the players and that. And he was usually the part of uh, a lot of practical jokes. He he was almost uh, like an extra player and the things he was able to get away with. So to me, that showed how beloved he was. Uh, he, he just was. Uh, really love but yeah i know he was there for years but i don't know tell how long not sure yeah i can remember um i can remember irv cupsonant and jack brickhouse talking about him during uh bears game season when i was uh, a kid growing up though he must oh, have been cool. character i mean <laughs> if the broadcasters are talking talking about him so <laughs> you said lots of, i mean that's just rang a rang a bell in my head from from my from my 
from, 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 from my uh, um, young days as a little kid, listening to the Bears on the radio. That's really neat. That, that's pretty cool. The uh, I have another question, and that is uh, when you mentioned that uh, Wrigley uh, reimbursed, so to speak, uh, Root the three thousand dollars which he uh, advised him to invest, or he had invested in the stock market. Do you know whether Wrigley did that for any other Cub players, or if he, if he gave them advice, and if so, if he uh, paid them the money they I lost? Not that I know of, and the only way I could know this is from Della uh, with, with Charlie. But yeah, not that I know of with any of the other players. And I think considering the amount of money that Charlie was making, uh, that would have been the real trigger for Wrigley to make sure that he was taking care of and investing it well and, and not, you know, not spending it all. Uh, although I'll tell you, uh, Della said every family member they had uh, ended up getting a check or help from Charlie uh, during the worst of the depression. And that was 1932. That's when it was really uh, tough times. And uh, there were a lot of family members that Charlie was able to help. So that $22,000 stretched a long way. And then he made, he made more than that in later years. I think he eventually got up into the 30s. But, you know, as Dallas said, uh, hamburger was 10 cents a pound uh, at that time. <laughs> and I think a car was what, like $2,000, something like that, a brand new car. <laughs> having, having, read the, having read the book, um, I, uh, I thought it interesting that uh, after, after the after the 32 season, went back to grammar school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was embarrassed that he hadn't finished uh, school. And I think a lot of it had to do, his dad was real rough. His, his dad was harsh. Now, the funny thing is that uh, all that Charlie ever heard from his dad was about uh, wasting his time on a child's game and all this. But uh, what was kind of neat is after his father passed away, uh, Charlie goes back to Middletown, Ohio, which is just not too far from Cincinnati. That's, that's where he grew up and where he was born. And he goes back to Middletown, and everybody in town is telling him about how his dad was bragging about him all the time and talking about it, you know how great a player he was and, and all of this. But he never told Charlie that. <laughs> Charlie never heard that. But, you know, his dad was a, a still spoke German. I mean, he was a tough guy. And uh, uh, so I'm sure he didn't pass out hugs and uh, kisses uh, too much. <laughs> I see you got a copy of your book displayed behind you. What else do you have behind you? <laughs> I mean, oh, uh, on the bookshelf behind you. About every baseball book ever written. <laughs> I see. I see. Uh, Is that does that probably look like most of your houses too? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What uh, What do you have planned next, Roger? You You working on anything? Uh, well, it, it's like I said earlier. Uh, I'm always gathering string and always, uh, uh, um, you know, fascinated by this and that and the other. I don't ever want to spend the hours in a chair again. <laughs> Those days are over. I I'm disabled. I've been lots of hours in the chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't see the the chats. Are there some chat questions in there? I haven't haven't looked at any anything I can answer. No, no was, it's it's just some facts people put up. It was uh, facts about Watshaw being a trainer for the Cubs for twenty nine years and. Coach Cuomo being a, a Cubs employee for 65 years. Oh, wow. 43, wow. 43 to, to 08 and 23 to 52 for Hotshaw. So there was some, some overlap there. So, wow. Oh, I see uh, John Laycock posted about his grandfather going to Wrigley 
in the 20s and 30s and staying after the game. They give you a bag to help clean up the stands, give you a ticket for the next day's game. Wrigley was really fanatical about keeping that stadium clean and, and constantly painting and everything that to, uh, to make a good presentation. And the reason was Wrigley was one of the early people that really wanted to get women at the games. And uh, he uh, would have a, uh, they had a ticket uh, uh, promotion where if uh, the lady got in free, if she brought her boyfriend to a game uh, and that was a huge success. And then the other thing was they uh, made fresh lemonade. That was their other specialty in concessions. And that's a pretty expensive thing to do at a, at a big ballpark. But that's also how all those lemons came pouring out of the stands uh, uh, when Ruth uh, pointed. <laughs> that's where the lemons came from. Yeah, that may be right. I see Robert here about Capone and Hartnett at Comiskey. That might be right. I didn't realize it was an exhibition game, but I know uh, the photo really got Gabby in trouble. That, that picture of him going over and talking to Capone sitting in the, the seat. Hi. Yeah, he, Gabby got called in by the commissioner by Landis and uh, um, uh, got, got uh, chewed out by him for that, uh, as, I, as I read. Now, uh, the players used to go over to a club that Capone owned uh, do you remember the, the suburb, Cicero, Cicero was the suburb, uh, where, uh, Capone owned a, a club and it had, um, not a glass floor, but some sort of laminate or clear, clear laminate floor or something where it had all these coins and silver dollars and everything on the floor. And then it was covered in like plexiglass or glass. I don't know if they had plexiglass and maybe it was glass. And that was on the dance floor. And the players used to go there all the time. They'd hang out at that club. Yeah, there were a string of clubs in, um, in, in Cicero along, along um, um, uh, what would it be, 22nd Street, which is today uh, Cermak, uh, Cermak Avenue or, or Cicero Avenue, though. Um, but um, there were also uh, quite a few in that neighborhood on the near north side and then Uptown, uh, which was uh, like Broadway and Lawrence, uh, north of the um, um, ballpark, uh, where, where a lot of the uh, visiting clubs stayed at the Edgewater Beach Hotel. That was a major entertainment area. And he owned a bar up there. Um, um, I'm trying to remember the name of I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's, it's still open as a jazz club, though. Um, uh, oh, wow. Uh, wow. To today. So the Green Mill, it's called called the Green Mill, is what it was called. It's still it's still there, same same building though, and that was uh, one of his uh, uh, outposts on the north side, though um, in enemy territory, so to speak. <laughs> All this is a lot of fun, and isn't it a great era? It's a great era for baseball and, and just uh, a lot of fun to, to learn uh, more about it. And, you know, the other, the other thing that was uh, just a nice part of this was to watch how young Burley Horn turned when he started talking about his baseball career. I mean, he was like an 80 year old man sitting on his porch, listening to the Reds on radio, but you could see him turn into a 20 year old when he started talking about, uh, baseball and, and his career. And by the way, the, the thing I thought was interesting, and there's every reason to believe this in all of the newspaper stories, uh, all this uh, trash talking about Rogers Hornsby and how terrible he was as a teammate and a person and all of that was definitely not true, uh, at least in the era when he was a player, but it was true when he was a manager. Uh, he was really despised as a manager when when he finally shifted over uh, to that role uh, with the Cubs after McCarthy left for the Yankees, uh, Hornsby didn't last very long. Um, the most frequent comment I heard is he thought everybody should be able to hit 400. He didn't think that was a big deal. Why, why do they have so much trouble 
uh, not being able to hit 400. So as a manager, terrible. As a teammate, uh, Burley said he treated him as a rookie just as well as he did everybody else. That Everybody liked him. I've got a question about um, Cubs training at Catalina. Um, how many how many teams did they um, they must have played a lot of interleague uh, games there because uh, I, I'm sorry inter squad games uh, at, at Catalina because that would have been a tough trip for a lot of teams to take during spring training uh, uh, to get out there first to go to Los Angeles and then to get on a boat and go to the island. Well, remember how lively the Pacific Coast League was. Uh, and so a lot of their games were with uh, uh, Pacific Coast League uh, teams. And, of course, those, those teams were playing pretty hard. They, they wanted to uh, get their name known and, and hopefully make uh, the big club and that. So uh, they did have some rotation like that. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't recall anything other than inter-squad or – minor league teams or whatever. Now they would go over to, it was a replica of Wrigley uh, field at LA that where the uh, uh, minor league uh, cup team played in the Pacific coast league. Uh, and they would go over there to meet uh, some teams to play too. So they didn't have to come all the way over to Catalina. But yeah, I can't recall of the major league teams, uh, I can't imagine there would have been, um, there were, there were some, um, uh, I think there was a, a team or two that had spring training in Texas, but I think that was about as far West as anybody went, you know, to get to warm weather and, and be able to do that. But boy, what a beautiful place. I mean, an amazing place to be able to go get ready for baseball. That was one of one of the stories that Ed Burns wrote in the Tribune. I kind of delighted when I found it on the microfilm. He was rubbing it in about how much snow they were getting in Chicago, and it was 72 degrees and sunny on the day that he sent his story back. <laughs> Oh, John, I see you posted about that other book, uh, The Cubs on Catalina. Uh, that author, uh, he contacted me after my book came out, and I got him in touch with Della. So he got a lot of pictures from Della and got some good quotes from her uh, on that. So we kind of helped each other out on, on that one. But that's an excellent book, the photos and, and all the details that go with it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a neat place if you haven't been to Catalina. My, my wife and I spent October 14th, 2003, uh, watching a game in the clubhouse there. Uh, for reference sake, that's the Bartman game. So <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was a long walk back to the hotel because uh, <laughs> I knew. <laughs> now, if you, go, if you go into the country club, Back in the locker room for the members, there are there is Cubs memorabilia back there. I mean, there's some jerseys uh, from the 1930s, from from that era, uh, and that's the closest thing to a Cub tribute or um, a museum on the island, other other than Lolo Saldana's uh, barbershop. <laughs> All right, you know, guys. Uh, Peter, Peter, I heard you say at the beginning your luncheon is called the called shot luncheon. Yes, we've had it geez, probably since our um, it wasn't my idea, but uh, we do a lunch once a month, the third Wednesday of the month. And we had pre COVID, of course, used to meet at the birthplace and eat there. Um, I know Jeff is on here, he was one of our regulars. Um, we used to have about six to 10 people would come every month and we'd sit in the, uh, just have an informal meeting and, and discussion in the uh, basement of the birthplace. Um, well, I could just say Della would have had something to say about the name of your legend. Well, you know, <laughs> we're on the opposite end of the, <clears throat> the spectrum here because obviously um, there are those who believe and, you know, and uh, that uh, not the Bendix type 
pointing, but a gesture was made and, and whatnot. And I'm sure this summer, I'm sure there'll be a Ruth panel at the, um, uh, at the convention um, with the, the best and the brightest of the experts there so we can debate it to the, to the nth degree. Um, as you know, 2020 was supposed to be the convention um, and that was the 100th anniversary of Ruth's first season as a Yankee um, that sort of changed the game. So we will, uh, you know, even though it's two years later, a lot of these uh, topics that would have been touched on in 2020 uh, will probably be somewhere part of uh, either a panel or at least an academic presentation at the convention. Um, and hopefully we get seven, 800 people and it could be the, the largest convention to date for you guys who were, were regulars um, until the, the gap occurred, unfortunately. Um, so I think the, the costs and uh, the hotel pricing and everything should be out by the end of this month. Well, that'll be a great opportunity for a lot of people. And uh, Baltimore is easy to access uh, from all over. So, yep. And uh, it's, it's got lucky for us, it's uh, a cheap city by comparison to New York and DC and, and some of the other hot spots on the East Coast. The tickets are cheaper because um, the ballpark's actually paid for, unlike most places. And um, so, you know, it should be a, a nice event. And we have a big opponent in town. We're not, it's not like we're getting Tampa or, or somebody um, who's not a big draw. So Boston will be in town um, that weekend. It just it lined up really good. Um, we're hoping to do a day at the ballpark. If you guys remember, we did it at Pittsburgh. And I think the Mets did it for us. Um, we went pregame. We were there in 2017, so we should have a, a somewhat of an event like that, hopefully, at Camden Yards, if not the day of the game, possibly the day before the game, because I believe that's an off day uh, with them traveling back. Um, the only thing that doesn't match up is uh, Washington is not in town during the convention, unless you come in a day or so early. I believe, I don't have the schedule in front of me, that the Cubs are in Washington um, that week in August from like Monday to Wednesday. So if you get there early, you can run down to the DC and see um, Chicago. Well, thanks Peter for the opportunity uh, to meet with you all tonight. And thanks for those great questions. I, I really appreciate uh, meeting y'all. Yeah, thanks guys. Anybody who's not okay. on our email list or um, War Saber members, just, you know, you can join every, as many chapters as you want. Um, so if you, uh, want to be part of our, I don't inundate you with messages, I promise, usually one to two a week tops. Um, you know, sign up and that way you can get our, uh, get our updates and, and, and whatnot. And obviously as we're moving closer to the convention, which is what, oh, only six months away now, six and a half, um, you'll be hearing more about us and, and the stuff that uh, you know, we have to offer. I will tell you, those of you who haven't been downtown in a while, it's kind of dead. Um, COVID did a number, as it has on a, a lot of cities, you know, some restaurants have disappeared and, and, and this and that, um, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll have an enjoyable experience, even though if it seems a little more quiet than you would normally hear in a major uh, East Coast city. Are, are all the barriers still up at the south side of the stadium? I don't think so. I think the... Um, on, you mean on the side of uh, the ballpark there? Yeah, the south side. Yeah, I think the, the barriers are down. I think they still have some of those trailers that were up for the COVID testing. Oh. Um, those gray trailers that were in the players' parking lot. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't think as much is there. But today, don't forget, there was the, the firemen's uh, funeral happened in, uh, in Baltimore Ooh. for the three firemen who, who perished in a, a tragic accident uh, a week and a half ago. So today was their funeral and there were fire trucks all over the country here kind of occupying all of the parking lots in between the stadiums. So it was hard to see what was going on. But I'll my way, make my way over and see, you know, sometime this weekend since yeah, I, I flipped I, miss I live a whole mile from the ballpark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I miss seeing what's going on down there. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you guys have any questions, you know, email me, those of you have my phone number, call, text. Um, happy to talk baseball at any time. Um, I know more about Baltimore and, and Babe Ruth stuff than I do anything else. Um, Orioles opening day is against Toronto on, uh, what is that, March 31st, the Thursday? 31st. Yeah. 
Um, and, um, and the Cubs actually come to Baltimore for a two game set sometime in early June. Um, I think it's like a Tuesday, Wednesday series, something like that. Um, so it's the only time I will root against the Cubs when they come to the Orioles. But, um, I guess that's about it. Unless you guys have any other questions or comments. Um, we'll see you again. Uh, the baseball babble discussion is the last Sunday of the month uh, at 7 p.m. Um, which is the I haven't heard anything about the, bat, the birthday bash yet. I can tell you they have a couple former Orioles, um, recent players who are not major league active that are going to participate. They're part of the Buck Joe Walter uh, era. Um, pretty big name guys um, who are going to be uh, interviewed. One who is uh, already in the Orioles team hall of fame. Um, they're going to be part of the discussion. Um, well, I think I thought by now we'd get, I know sometimes we had, there was some fees to play if you wanted to participate in something last year. Yeah, I, that's why it's being bumped until um, the week of the 20, it'll be like between the 22nd and 25th. Oh my gosh, that late. Yeah. So a lot of that has to do with people's availability. And don't forget, it's not just baseball, but the museum does the, you know, Herp stuff and and, and, oh, yeah. and you know, oh yeah yeah and sometimes the old Baltimore Colts and whatever so um, you know it's getting everybody on the same page and uh, you know but uh, it's still gonna happen so that's good and I'll be sharing all that info for you guys who don't uh, follow the Babe Ruth Museum since our chapter they support us and everything we do we support them um, and the uh, the Zoom as it was last year it was 100 percent free unless you wanted to uh, you know be able to ask questions to one of the guests or something yeah, that, you can pay a little bit of a fee. Yeah, that John Miller one last year was great. Yeah. Uh, last Miller. year they had John Miller, Boop Powell, Brooks, and Brooks, yeah. Uh, Palmer. Yeah. yeah. It was it was wonderful. And it's, it's been recorded. Um, so hopefully all those guys, including John Miller, might be at the this summer's convention if the, all the stars line up. So um, we could have the Sabre record for the most Cooperstown players appearing at one convention. Oh, um, good, good. So, um, so fingers crossed. The Orioles are very, very involved and and supporting, and a whole bunch of the Orioles, uh, like their publicist and their senior vice president for community relations and everything, are actually Saber members now. So, um, we we're 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 in with the right group. So we're we're very pleased, and uh, hopefully the convention will be worth the three year gap <laughs> um, when we finally get there. Uh, Roger, everybody, thank you very much. All right, Pete. Um, this will be up on on the, the Saber website probably in a day or so. Jacob will put it up. And uh, like I said, if you need, need anything, just give me a holler, and I'll see uh, some of my regulars and you guys pretty soon. All right, Pete. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.